27-year-old Farazay Dehagenpour was an Iranian exchange student at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. She was a brilliant math student, admired by her peers and her family in Iran. In fact, it was her math skills that got her so far in life. Firuzeh's friends were in awe of her math skill set and described her as a person with a grand presence. She would entertain her guests with Persian delights and serve Persian tea. Firuze had an important appearance, and it was clear that this girl was destined for great things in life. She was set to graduate with an engineering degree with a double major from the university. Farizé lived with a Jordanian girl sharing an apartment on 517 North 88th Plaza. The roommate last spoke to Farizé on August 13, 1983. Farizé had called her while working in the computer center. She did not have a plan on how she would get home from the center, since she did not have a ride back. Farizé's roommate was not worried, as Farizé said that she will call back later. But by 11.45 p.m., Farizé had not called back. It had been raining earlier, so her roommate got a bit worried and set out to look for her. There were not cell phones back then, so she could not just simply call her. Shortly after midnight, she went to the university computer center, but did not find Farizé there. According to another friend, Perand Kia, perhaps Firuze had sought a metro train or intended to hitchhike. But those who knew her well knew Firuze would never hitchhike. It was just not like her. Another friend had seen Firuze around 6.30 p.m. that night when he drove her to the computer center. She had told him to pick her up when she was free. But since he was unable to return after midnight, Firuze assured him she would find a way home. Her friends grew increasingly concerned when she did not return by 3 a.m., but they went to sleep. Finally, by 8 a.m., there was still no sign of Firuze, and they knew something had gone horribly wrong. A missing persons report was officially filed on the morning of August 14, 1983, by another acquaintance, Abu Hassan. Who lived nearby. A few hours later, fishermen were walking along a gravel road called the River Road when they came across something unusual and horrifying. They discovered Firuze's undressed body disposed of under a bridge over Pigeon Creek north of Council Bluffs, Iowa. She appeared to have been severely beaten. Her personal belongings and papers were found with her body, suggesting she may have lost her life at the hands of someone she knew. Had she been kidnapped or grabbed randomly, she would have probably dropped some of her things. There was evidence that suggested she had lost her life elsewhere and was brought to the bridge. According to the chief deputy at the time, Sheriff Steve Troga, an autopsy revealed that she lost too much blood from several cuts to her throat and had suffered four abdominal stab wounds. She had been physically and intimately assaulted. Officers recovered blood and hair found on the bridge railing where Firuze was found. The blood and hair found at the crime scene were tested, and while some of the blood did not belong to Firuze, the hair was hers. Interestingly, the blood type was different on the items, type O and type A. Type O matched Firuze, but type A did not render a match. It was another person's blood. But that was all you could determine in the 80s. Investigators initially interviewed her acquaintances and took fingerprints and hair samples from over 100 UNO students in the month following the slaying but these efforts brought about no results. It was determined that Firuze had last been seen around 9.30 p.m. when she left the UNO campus, but nobody saw anything suspicious. Firuze's roommate informed Firuze's family in England about her tragic passing, 
who subsequently informed her parents who were in Tehran, Iran. At the time, there was political unrest in Iran. The Shah of Iran had been recently exiled, and Ayatollah Khomeini had taken to run the country. There were protests, problems, and reforms. The director of international student services at UNO, Ms. Kia, revealed that Firuzeh was a member of a leftist Iranian political group called Fashian, but was not known to be extremely politically active. Additionally, Ms. Kia remarked that Firuzeh was a quiet, sober individual, well-liked by her peers. Nobody had any motive to harm her. She was not the sort of girl to wander off with strangers or take any illegal substances. Many people believed Firuzeh's incident had a political agenda behind it. However, at least one official denied the possibility. Ultimately, her case drew the attention of the FBI, with Herb Hawkins Jr. serving as the agent in charge for Nebraska and Iowa. They initiated an investigation to determine if a federal kidnapping statute had been breached. A pivotal element of their inquiry revolved around the location of the slaying and the uncertainty of Firuzeh's state when she crossed from Nebraska into Iowa. Basically, was she alive when she crossed the state line? The investigation into Firuzeh's demise spanned several months in 1983 and involved collaboration with multiple law enforcement agencies. However, despite their dedicated efforts, the case eventually went cold. Decades passed as Firuzeh's case was shelved away. The real breakthrough came when, decades later, Sergeant Jim Doty of the Potawatomi County Sheriff's Office was contacted by UNO graduate Stephen Martin. Martin traveled around the world for his career, but he never stopped thinking about Firuze. In fact, in November of 2020, he remembered an individual who had been cleared of any charge in her case thanks to a dependable alibi. He contacted Sergeant Doty. While the suspect was still in the clear, Sergeant Doty realized that items could be re-examined. He insisted Firuze's case be reopened in light of recent advances in forensics. Sergeant Doty conducted a DNA analysis on the evidence gathered years and years ago, on items including her undergarments, the left-hand glove, computer papers, and a beer can. In March 2021, the test results shed new light on the case. The glove had bloodstains, with Firuze's DNA profile, as well as a new person's genetic material. The computer papers near her body had four fingerprints. Two of them were identified. One belonged to Firuze, the other to a computer consultant at UNO. Surprisingly, there was a match on the combined DNA index system, CODIS, database. The match? a seasoned felon called Bud Leroy Christensen. Christensen was on an offenders list. He had a history of serious offenses, with at least three convictions that found him guilty of having assaulted a minor in 1972. Two offenses were similar in nature involving adults, and they were more recent in 2014. He was also charged with possession of a firearm by a felon in 1999. In the most recent assault case, Christensen pled guilty to attempted second-degree assault and first-degree false imprisonment. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Listed as a permanent offender, the streets were safe from Christensen until his release in May of 2018. Sergeant Doty informed Stephen Martin of the news. Martin had moved to Nevada after graduation, where the 62-year-old lives to this day. The fact that the decades-old mystery was finally going to be solved was incredible. Sergeant Doty spoke to Firuze's brother for over an hour. 
Her brother was in London when he got the news of the DNA match. The family finally had answers. Her brother was so stunned he was unable to speak or process the information. It was time for some closure after 37 years. Christensen was arrested in Omaha on April 30, 2021 and held on a $1 million bond. He waived his right to resist extradition to Iowa where his trial was going to take place. 67-year-old Christensen was held in the Douglas County Jail waiting transport to Potawatomi County on a first-degree charge of taking an innocent life. He confessed to his crimes. At the time of Firaze's heartless slaying, he would have been 30 years old. On April 6, 2023, Bud Leroy Christensen was sentenced to 50 years in prison for taking Firaze's life. Stephen Martin and some of Firaze's old friends are petitioning for a posthumous degree for Firaze, 38 years after her slaying, to honor her memory and accomplishments. She is said to have been one of the brightest minds of you know. Thanks to the officers and friends who never gave up, they were able to put a monster behind bars. Born in 1983, Megan McDonald was only seven months old when her parents moved to Middletown, New York. She had a sister named Karen and two younger brothers. From Little League games to movies, Karen and Megan were best friends. Megan would often rescue strays and be incredibly compassionate, even with grown-ups. In college, Karen met the love of her life, James Whelan. When James was nervous about meeting Karen's family for the first time, 16-year-old Megan put him at ease immediately, incredibly warm and welcoming, so he would feel like a member of the family. Megan had a creative imagination. She named their cat Pumpkin James Whalen to include him in the family too. Megan graduated from Burke Catholic High School with the class of the year 2000. Then she went on to attend SUNY Orange in Middletown. It is a community college and Megan was happy to be close to home. Megan loved children and considered working in a field where she would be in contact with them. In 2002, Megan's family suffered a devastating blow when she lost her father, Dennis McDonald. At only 47 years old, Officer McDonald was a retired detective from the New York Police Department and unexpectedly passed away due to a heart attack. But they never stopped being a family and still got together for Christmas in 2002, not knowing it would be the last Christmas Megan would spend with the family. A family video shows Megan opening a box of sweaters and gushing over it, sticking the bow on her head revealing just how warm and gracious she was. Around the same time was when Megan got her first job. It was the first step in getting her life back together after the loss of her father. Karen recalled the first time Megan got her coffee with her own money. She was incredibly proud of herself for having earned money from her first job. Megan realized she could make it. A year after her father's passing, Megan decided it was time to make a big step forward in her life. In March 2003, Megan signed a lease for an apartment near Middletown, a small town of Wallkill, New York. Megan looked forward to starting her life as an adult, completely independent, but that would be sadly short-lived. Megan worked at the American Cafe in Galleria Mall and was waiting tables from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on March 13, 2003. After that, she walked to a Closby Banks ATM to withdraw cash at exactly 3.10 p.m. She was later spotted in Greenway Terrace in Wallkill, New York. Two acquaintances were throwing a birthday party, and they invited her in but Megan refused. 
They went back inside and told everyone that Megan had plans with some other friends in Middletown. Next, Megan was at a friend's house from 7.30 p.m. to 12 a.m., watching the TV show Friends. Then Megan headed home, telling her friend she had to get some sleep or she would be late for work the next day. Little did the friend know it would be the last time she would see Megan alive. Instead of going straight home, Megan stopped at the birthday party in the Greenway Terrace area in Wallkill. Two friends who were leaving the party spotted her in her car. They exchanged a few words, and Megan told them she was waiting to meet someone. It was 12.30 a.m., just after midnight, the last time anyone saw Megan McDonald alive. Megan did not show up for her afternoon shift at the American Cafe later in the day. They left voicemails on her phone. Her friends and family realized she was not in touch or taking any calls, not responding to any text messages. Her mother asked Karen to check on her as she was not answering. At first, Karen and James Whalen were a little annoyed at Megan being so irresponsible. However, as the day progressed, they grew increasingly worried. They lived two hours from where Megan was last seen, and they could not trace her. Daylight burnt into night, and then the next day, they were met with terrible news. The next morning, a man and his nephew came across something shocking. The owners of 229 Bowser Road in the town of Wallkill saw something lying at an odd angle. To their horror, they realized it was a body. The body of a young woman, and they called 911, reaching the state police. New York State Police were able to identify the body through the driver's license and ID'd her as Megan McDonald, the missing 20-year-old. An autopsy revealed she had been struck with a blunt object, which proved to be fatal. Detective Brad Natalizio detailed that the area adjacent to Bowser Road was a slender dirt trail that ended in a cul-de-sac, nestled within an isolated field. The area was isolated, and the detective deduced that she would have known the person who led her there, as it would be dangerous to drive all alone out so far at night. Someone was with Megan as she drove there, someone she trusted, and then the person took her life. State police found out that Megan owned a 1991 Mercury Sable, but it was not at the scene of the crime, so a search ensued to recover her car. Local police were able to get media coverage to help solve Megan's mystery. Some days later, police received a tip that the car was parked at the Kensington Manor apartment complex. The investigation revealed that the car had been parked there since early morning around 8 on March 14th, so it had been there for some time. It was evident that the driver left in a hurry. Investigators got a lot of evidence and lifted many things that would help get a proper DNA analysis. Over 700 items were bagged and kept in storage. Officers deduced that someone was sitting in the driver's seat of Megan's car and had struck her with a fatal blow. Frustratingly, after no further leads, Megan's case unfortunately went cold for quite a while. Detectives Brad Natalizio and Michael Carletta grew up in the area and knew about the missing woman. Megan's case was the biggest local mystery for a long, long time. Twenty years later, on the 20th anniversary of Megan's unfortunate demise, her case was featured on a popular TV show called Dateline. Her case was highlighted and subsequently, efforts were doubled. In 2018, the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit took on the case aiming to profile the suspect and devise a theory. After going through the crime scene and autopsy photos, along with exhaustive case files containing over 800 leads and interviews, their theory aligned with the conclusions reached at Troop F Barracks on Crystal Run Road in the town of Wallkill. 
they determined that the perpetrator exhibited all the hallmarks of narcissistic personality disorder, as defined by the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, a pervasive pattern of grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, a constant need for admiration and a lack of empathy, beginning by early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts. Detective Natalizio and Carletta were assigned to the case in 2017, and since they were aware of the local stories they had heard growing up, they had a lot of insight. Natalizio never stopped working on Megan's case, even when he switched jobs, so her case went across departments and the community. Natalizio was Megan's age and grew up in Orange County. When he began working for the NYPD in 2006, his wife urged him to solve Megan's case if he ever got promoted. The detective's wife was a registered nurse who worked alongside Megan's mother, so there was a personal connection. The officers began with re-interviewing all witnesses and suspects. They went back to Kensington Manor Apartments and found some interesting information. Around 12.30 a.m., the night Megan lost her life, a witness spotted her car. Megan's car was white with a black stripe on the side, so it was something you would notice. But that is not what caught the witness's attention. There was loud music blaring from the system in the car, so loud that she had to look outside and check. There was another car trailing Megan's vehicle, a dark Honda Civic hatchback. The complex has a big loop, so both of the cars circled back, the music still loud. It provided a timeline. Megan was alive at 12.30 a.m., which means the crime occurred sometime between 12.30 a.m. and 8 a.m. The main theory was that two people followed Megan in the car, somehow got into her back seat, and took her to Bowser Road, where her body was recovered. The assailant was in the back seat, and they had a friend in the passenger seat while Megan drove. Whoever this person was, they had some control over Megan, possibly psychologically. They drove to a secluded field off Bowser Road, a place where teenagers and young people would hang out to drink. The entrance was so tricky that a person would normally miss it, but the assailant knew exactly where he was taking them, and possibly knew that any confrontation would not be heard because the area was isolated. It was so quiet that one could hear a far-off train engine simply standing on the spot. Megan possibly got into an argument with this person, which resulted in the perpetrator flying into a rage, hitting her repeatedly with a blunt object. The passenger sitting beside Megan was possibly in shock, but whatever it was, the assailant managed to convince them not to go to the police. After disposing of her body, the two individuals brought her car back and parked it, thereafter running off. Investigators analyzed all the objects lifted from Megan's car, and a private lab called Cybergenetics was tasked with re-examining the DNA in 2023 to put to test the advances in forensic technology. A company by the name of Lamar Advertising has been providing free exposure for Megan for many years. They funded seven billboards for Megan along State Route 17 in Orange and Sullivan Counties, as well as on Interstate 84 in Orange County. They urged people with any information to come forward. The NYP Detective Union offered $10,000 for any information regarding Megan, and the FBI also offered $10,000, amounting to a total of $20,000. Surprisingly, before DNA could bring about something conclusive, the Honda Civic with a loud system was identified. They marked it down to two suspects, one of whom was Megan's ex-boyfriend, Edward Holly. Suspect number two has never been publicly identified. It was revealed that he passed away in 2010. 
He left a voicemail on Megan's phone on March 9, 2003 at 1.24 a.m. with loud music in the background. Investigators discovered that Megan had $21.92 in her account at the time after she deposited $1,158.33 into her HSBC account. Then, on March 10th, she overdrafted it by $869.92. In three of Holly's interviews, he admitted that he owed her $300, because she helped him buy a purple 1990 Honda Civic hatchback. Yes, the very car they had been looking for. On the day that the crime took place, Megan had an altercation with Edward Holly, which he admitted in all of his police interviews. Megan's landlord came forward to give additional information. On March 13, 2003, around 9 a.m., Megan's landlord saw a man in her apartment on Karen Drive. The man was her new boyfriend, whose name has been withheld in documents. An hour later, she dropped him off at his house on Sheffield Drive in Wallkill and headed to work. Interestingly, the reason Megan did not go to the party on Greenway Terrace was because Edward Holly was at the party. Through witness accounts and police records, it was deduced that Megan tried to buy marijuana from various sources. She called someone at 10.57 p.m., then contacted the person again at 11.25, but he could not get any for her. Again, at 12.05 a.m., a witness spotted her at the ATK gas station on 152 Wisner Avenue in the city of Middletown, where she was asking the clerk for a Dutch, which is slang for a marijuana cigarette. That witness also saw her car outside, but did not see anyone in it. Suspect number two was contacted by Megan several times during the night, the last call at 12.25 a.m., when she went to pick him up at his house on Cindy Lane in Wallkill. He was sitting in the passenger seat and told her he did not have any marijuana. She finally said she would get some from Edward Holly. Witnesses saw Holly leave the party just before midnight on March 13th. Just after midnight, that would be March 14th, Holly and Megan's phones pinged off the towers in the Scotchtown area in the town of Wallkill, which was the time frame officers had for Megan picking up her assailant. Holly admitted he knew Megan was outside the party but that he went straight home to 66 Sandberg Court in the town of Wallkill. However, the cell phone tower and witnesses placed him in the vicinity of the crime scene. Holly had a history of domestic violence, and he had ample motive to hurt Megan since he owed her a lot of money. The FBI helped put the final pieces of this intricate puzzle together thanks to their Behavioral Analysis Unit. It was possible that Holly had a disagreement with Megan. Known for being opinionated, her sister Karen admits this theory held ground for them. It was indeed possible that Megan had a disagreement with her ex, and he struck her in a moment of rage. Megan's last outgoing call at 12.30 a.m. was to Holly, which she claims was simply to get marijuana. However, this makes Holly the last person to see her alive, and given his history, locations, and the fact that he never came clean about being with her in the time frame of her demise, he is definitely a prime suspect. On April 20th, 2023, the New York State Police arrested Edward Holly and charged him with taking Megan's life in the second degree. Holly was involved in a car crash in 2007 after which he lost use of his legs. He was already in jail for violating probation while involved in a narcotics case in October of 2021. Now 42 years old, Holly would have been 22 when he took Megan's life. As officers wheeled him away, clad in an orange jumpsuit, he screamed at the cameras that he was innocent and that he loved Megan. 
His two daughters rushed to his side in an attempt to show support, while the McDonald's shouted, Justice for Megan. The second suspect in the case allegedly took his own life and has still not been named by the police. Unfortunately, Holly was released without bail because the prosecutors made a small mistake. They failed to present the case to a grand jury in time. However, Edward Holly had to appear in court in June and August. His next court date will be after Thanksgiving. When convicted, he faces 25 years to life in prison. Megan's family sought comfort in the fact that the man who mercilessly slayed her has finally been identified, while Karen says her little sister will never get to see the series finale of her favorite show, Friends. The family is grateful for the opportunity to give her a proper goodbye, as in many such cases, the body is not recovered as quickly.